In a hidden camp in Northern California, I found out why I'll never go in the woods again. Written by Dream Eater 096. After my girlfriend left me for a better prospect, I was shattered. A week of drinking and in my hangover, I decided that I needed to make a change. Just get away from it all. Stop seeing reminders everywhere I went. I would put life down for a while so that I could come back swinging. Everyone has a different way of doing this, but for me, it would be a trip to Arcata. I had more than enough vacation days. Since we had started fighting, I had buried myself in my work, racking up a decent savings and a cache of benefit hours. I took calls for a company in a cubicle. One among an anthill of us, a hair's breadth away from killing ourselves in the parking lot outside. Living the dream was the acceptable answer to, how are you? A phrase parroted by us all. It was code word for, please take me outside and shoot me. We can make it look like an accident, I swear. Anyone who's worked beneath those bleak fluorescent lights knows exactly what I mean. In lieu of my circumstances and despite even the breakup, I was almost giddy in turning in the leave forms. Two weeks in a row. Are you sure you want to cash all that out at once? The general manager eyed my papers looking for any excuse to reject it. With a cacophony of voices and ringing phones behind me, like the screams of the damned, I plead my case. Uh, cashing it out now means that I'll be here for the product launch and the holidays. My mind was racing for something, anything else to say. Besides, the break should help me get my numbers back up. My boss, with a solemn nod, continued over my papers. He knew as well as I did my numbers tanked since about a month ago, and the rumor mill was abuzz with why. Everything from catching her cheating to shooting heroin in the bathroom. Finally, he gave a shrug and bid me farewell. Finish the week strong, and when you come back, I expect you at peak performance. I thanked him for the approval, and I went back to my desk, floating, The next week, I spent planning and packing a hike in the Humboldt Forest. Finally, with a hopeful spirit, I made the trip. The drive from boys to Humboldt country was a full day within itself. A trip full of lie pits and sand in the wasteland of the Oregon desert. Thirteen hours of beef jerky and chips until I crossed the California border with another eight miles after it. It wasn't until the sun was up the next day that I reached my destination. It was then, as the sun rose on the ocean front, that I knew it was worth every second. A sea of orange and yellow crested the lost coast. Sands lined with tall grass and every shade of green. A primordial fog covered everything like a veil over something holy. It was as though the rainforest was conquering the very waters it had bordered. The deepest green I'd ever seen lay in that constant fog, in an air that felt ancient and wondrous to venture. The redwoods larger than buildings, feeling older than mankind, sat on the horizon in rolling hills. It made you believe in magic, if only for a day. Regaining my composure, I headed into town. The place in that fog felt eerie to step inside. It's funny, you would have expected Arcata to be a haunted cove. A dreary place with a Lovecraftian cult of Dagon, its population. And yet, it was quite the opposite. Dozens of houses with walls of every color lined the streets. Bars, boutiques, and bodegas surrounded a town center full of every walk of life. Travelers, hobos, street performers, and more. All of them sat in the cool air in laughter and song in a world where time stood still, for no one had anywhere to be. 
It was a decade since I sat among them last, yet even now I felt at home. I went into a dive bar and dropped a tin on drinks. I cashed out my vacation hours to be here and I intended to make the best of it. After a couple of pints of great white, I wandered around town. The beer helped me relax and soon I was making conversation with the locals. An old traveler by the name of Trashcan and I became friends. He had stories and a reputation in town and I cigarettes with an ear to listen. He smoked off an old glass pipe in a swirl of colors. I politely declined, to which he shrugged, sitting cross-legged on the park bench. So, what brings you to town if you don't like to smoke? He asked. Humboldt County was the center of the marijuana export known as the Emerald Triangle. Arcata was the center of that. Me not smoking must have raised an eye. I knew good and well, however, that Idaho labor would be testing me the second I stepped back home. I pulled out a Pall Mall and smoked that instead. Camping, I replied. Camping, he parroted with a look of suspicion. You crashing on the beach for a spell? Finding a hippie chick or two? He asked. I breathed the smoke into the air nonchalantly. Actually, I'm going to Neverland. The hobo's face went cold. How do you know about that? His response surprised me. It was a secret spot for sure, yet by no means was it considered hostile. I tried to bring back the jovial air we had had before with a laugh. I was a street kid before I found work in Idaho. It's not like the place is haunted. Trash can did not find me funny. Not at all. You don't want to go there. He put away his pipe, stuffing the smokes I gave him into his beanie. Not anymore. Well, no disrespect, but two states is a long way to drive. Is there any reason why? I asked. He ignored the question, stood up, and grabbed his bag. The town's a great place to be. You got money, get a hotel, hit the bars, get yourself a girl and stay here. But stay out of the jungle, especially here. He don't want anyone there at all. I was about to ask who, but he turned his back and left, wandering into the crowd alone. His face looked like someone had walked across his grave. Despite his misgivings, I was not about to be sent home by a stranger. He probably wanted the spot for himself, for all I knew. I may not be the traveling type anymore, but provided I respected the grounds, I had as much right to be there as anybody. The rest of the day, I walked around and I hit the bars until I finally did get a cheap motel. It was a long drive and I needed a rest before the hike. The next morning was coffee and McDonald's. Soon after, I hit the Safeway and got some food for my pack. Cliff bars, jerky, Gatorade, and the like. Walking through the aisles sent me back. It was just a few years ago, a kid in blonde dreads was filling a drug rug hoodie with whatever he could steal. I don't miss my hair rotting in the rain, yet I certainly missed the freedom. It was around noon that I began the trek. Behind the college, there were hiking trails mixed with the campus grounds. Stoners would wander the woods, taking in the sights, yet the further you went, the less company you'd find. After a mile in, the forest even ate the trail in places. Humboldt is home to the only rainforest in North America, a world primordial with ferns and leaves growing crimson in the sun. Husks of giants you could climb like an ant over branches. Birds calling and everywhere teeming with life. It had a way of making you feel so small and the world so far away. Living in these woods before I knew the way well enough, anytime I got lost I would find a landmark and regain my footing. A rope bridge over a ravine a dead, hollowed-out tree with a seat carved in the bark. 
Even here, man had left their mark. If you only knew where to look. Sitting in a patch of moss, I caught my breath. I grabbed some clovers that tasted of apples, and I thoughtfully chewed while I considered my progress. If I remembered right, it was only a couple of more miles. My boots were muddy and my back was sore. Office life had taken its toll and I was by no means used to all this hiking. Still, I kept in high spirits, realizing in the fog and the trees that I was actually happy. It was then that I looked around and something caught my eye. One of the trees I thought had carvings in it. Upon further inspection, I learned that I was right. A series of hieroglyphs carved into the bark of a lone redwood. Defacing one of these ancient trees while alive is considered an act akin to sacrilege. However, this graffiti was different. No heart with a lover's name, no obscenity, or was here. Instead, it was a series of hieroglyphs. Three diagonal lines slashed in a quick succession. It was followed by a circle. And finally, there was another circle with two arrows carved pointing back where I came. If memory served, the message was clear. This was not a safe place. There is nothing to be gained. Hit the road. I would have turned around right then and there if not for my memories before. As I said, I was not a stranger to these woods. Once there was a gang of us, lost boys high and drunk, swinging from the trees like we were born for it. Now it was only me. What friends there were either died in a heroin overdose or lived long enough to screw each other over for another hit of meth. Even still, I would not be turned away. For years I wandered and earned the right to be here. I would be lying if I said that there was no fear in my heart. The smallest voice had said to listen. I stuffed it down, of course. Far too stubborn to pay it any mind. I strapped my bag to my back and I shouldered on. It was only another hour. I found the ravine cutting through and I broke from the tiny path that I had tracked. The water shimmered in the setting sun, but... Anyone from around here could tell you that it wasn't safe to drink. It was something about the flora. The roots bled deep in the water, and while it tasted sweet, they said that it drove you mad. Still, the little dribble marked the way just as it had before. The author of that message was of course aware of this having put his sign so close. A mile up that ravine and I had arrived. Through a clearing in the forest deep was a weave of rope and wood. Ladders tied from branches high. Lines for tents and hammocks alike wrapped around the trunks of trees. There was even the remains of the swing that we had made from a skateboard. That board had shattered, splintered throughout the camp. Even then, it was just as I had remembered. Never, never land. I lay down my pack, reminiscing on the days when I had not a care in the world. Dancing around drunk and high with my brothers and I. In that moment, we thought that we would live forever. Or maybe we didn't think about life at all. Perhaps it was all the better. One died from an overdose, hiding from an angry father. Another wandered on his own back to a reservation where his family stayed. Another was raising a son that he knew wasn't his. His wife's infidelity swept under the rug like so many times before. The last now walked the world alone, having burned every bridge from everyone he had ever loved. Lampwick blinding to anything except his immediate gain... And then there was me, the loser kid with a big mouth and bigger dreams. 
I threw them down the drain for a desk job whittling away my years in quiet desperation. Still madly in love with a woman who even then had one eye and foot always out the door. Sitting there alone, I felt like the biggest fool of all. And that was when it hit me. Any forest, especially one like this, was always abuzz with life. A cacophony of birds, the creak of giant branches in the wind stories above. The ravine abuzz with the path it traveled. Now, there wasn't a sound. Not hardly a sound, but no noise at all. No birds. No rustle of wind through the leaves. Nothing. My own breath resounded in my chest as I could hear my heart beat inside my ears amidst the silence. The worms of fight or flight slithering in my guts as I listened for something, anything to prove that I was sane. While my ears gave cause for alarm, my eyes had followed suit. The shanty town my friends and I had built years ago formed a circle with a flat within its center. Lighting fires was an invitation for getting robbed. Men from all walks of life roamed these woods and not all were friendly. Even so, we'd sit around the center, share our food with stories of what fun we'd have tomorrow. Even if we did light a fire, it would have been years ago. There was no reason for the center of a rainforest to have a patch of nothing in its core. Dirt as dead as coffin nails surrounded by a ring of fungal spores. A fairy circle. Every nerve in my body screamed to leave, yet looking up at the sky, I found that the sun had one finger left on the horizon. If these woods were dangerous before... Then at nightfall, it would be all the worse. With a heavy heart and trembling hands, I opened my bag and I began setting up camp. At midnight, there was a rustling among the leaves. The silence broke. The wind wailed in the night air with the hoot and howl of all manner of wildlife, calling for blood and for judgment. It was then in the tree line that a silhouette took shape in the dark. The form of a man yet twisted with branch and leaves splintered and creaked with every step. It glided among the trees surrounding the camp in swooping circles. A cat toying with its prey. A pair of glittering orange eyes glared down at a yellow tint. The creature hung above this affront, eyes blaring all the brighter. Its very presence screamed without a word. How dare you enter these hollowed grounds? How dare you defile it with your presence? Finally, it made its move. It dove into the tent with its claws slashing again and again. The animal life roared in approval as the man of green slashed and slaughtered all inside that tent. It was with every ounce of luck and answered prayer that I lived to witness this. Curled in a ball, cowering beneath the roots. After laying my decoy, I dug beneath the tree, careful not to disturb the roots beneath and I hid beneath that ancient giant, a rat inside of its little burrow. Through the smallest hole I left for air, I watched the attempt on my life. Thankfully, it was only my belongings that it destroyed. The green man thrashed and tore, breaking every piece of plastic scattering any metal, leaving only the fiber cords which trees claimed as their own. It was all devoured by the undergrowth and the vines like clasping hands, rotted to a mulch in sacrifice. I thought that I had escaped it, 
trembling there with tears rolling down my cheeks, and my hope against hope that I had outsmarted nature's incarnation. And yet, as dawn broke, and I crawled forth from my hole, I learned that I could not have been further from the truth. Looking there upon the tree in which I had hid were the words written in moss, moss, 